So there's a direct re- relationship between what we eat and our brain function. Um, and there's a variety of things that are involved. Um, we've been uh, looking at cytokines, obesity we've looked at, insulin resistance. Obviously, we've beaten diabetes to death. We will cover homocysteine, and they all relate to cognitive decline. The bottom line is that these are modifiable factors, and that's where we do our work. This is what our, our day's work should be, is preventing this decline. In the 4th century BC, the Yellow Emperor in the Neijing said that prevention is the ultimate principle of wisdom. To cure a disease after it has manifested is like digging a well when one already feels thirsty or forging weapons when the war has already begun. So, as John Kennedy said in his inauguration speech, it's actually the uh, first words of the Better Brain book, the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. So, you know, all of these things that we're talking about should be part of the well person examination. When people come to see us now, it's more than checking your cholesterol and uh, checking the prostate and uh, doing a mammogram and bone density. It's looking at these mediators and measurements of things which predict issues to come. I mean, I, I know that Patrick Hannaway is lecturing to this group about uh, genomics and, ah, darn it, and uh, the effects and, and what we can predict about people based upon their genomic profiles, which is really great. But, uh, you know, this is what we hope to have when we're older, but this is unfortunately uh, an atrophic brain where the, there's huge valleys between the mountains and a brain which has been burned a brain which was on fire from inflammation, which is where we're going to go. Um, so we talked about diabetes, and again, glycation proteins, cytokines, uh, COX-2 upregulation by the effects of advanced glycosylated end products. We covered the hypothalamic pituitary axis and how it's upregulated in the diabetic and how that creates a feed-forward cycle that continues to damage the hippocampus. And we also talked about the NMDA receptor and its, its, its pivotal role in terms of the ingress of calcium and how that ultimately leads to demise of the mitochondria, apoptosis, and ultimately neuronal failure. So bottom line is what we need to focus on are what are called bioenergetic therapies. Now, that's not where we you know, swing a pendulum or use crystals. It's where we attack uh, this dysfunction at the level of the mitochondria. We upregulate mitochondrial function. And that requires the use of antioxidants. Well, we've been looking at glucose and its role in activating the mitochondria through uh, diabetes. We're going to focus a little bit now on reactive oxygen species. And in so doing, <clears throat> we again have to revisit this whole concept of excitotoxicity, where, again, any dysfunction of the mitochondria leads to decreased ATP production neuronal depolarization, persistent NMDA activation, and influx of calcium. I know you can do it. And then that further damages the mitochondria. Anything that causes mitochondrial dysfunction can set the stage. So here is our mitochondrion. And uh, this is ultimately where we focus our therapeutic interventions. And this is where we get the rewards of seeing patients improve, recognizing that Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and viral encephalitis, these are all ultimately mitochondrial diseases that are acquired, that are not the inherited mitochondropathies that we learned about and promptly forgot. So a variety of things can damage the mitochondria, not the least of which are so many of the drugs used today. Statin drugs are mitochondrial toxins. Xenobiotic issues, uh, toxins that are, uh, we are exposed to in our environment, Endotoxins are toxins that are derived from processes within our own physiology can damage the mitochondria. Metabolic dysfunction, including, as mentioned, uh, adrenal issues, thyroid issues, viral infections, dramatically uh, seen these days. But <clears throat> the focus on, for example, multiple sclerosis, what is, what's the mainstream approach to MS? Take interferon, right. And when you have a flare-up, we'll load you up with steroids because we know that MS is a prototypic autoimmune disease. For some reason, the immune system goes haywire, and suddenly an autoimmune phenomenon happens where your immune system attacks and digests the myelin. That's as far as it gets. 
right? So what we need to do is turn off the immune system. We will load our patients up with steroids, and that's the treatment for MS because these macrophages uh, are gobbling up the, the uh, myelin, the, the MAC cells. So it's sort of like a big MAC attack on the brain. These macrophages are going crazy and eating the myelin. But we should ask ourselves, why is it happening in the first place? These people are not prednisone or solumedrol deficient. That's, they're not interferon deficient. What is causing the problem in the first place? Well, the brass ring for many years was thought to be, what is the infectious agent in MS? And we certainly know that there are findings, markers of chlamydia pneumonia in the spinal fluid in most MS patients, as demonstrated at Vanderbilt. HHV type 6 has been looked at, Epstein-Barr has been looked at, but now it looks as if for whatever reason, whatever might be the pathogen, the, the proximate initiator of the immune response is that cells suddenly stop working and then look foreign to the immune system. And when cells stop working, it's actually a metabolic change involving these glial and neural, uh, uh, neural cells that neuronal metabolic dysfunction and neuronal loss is closely associated with these progression and disability. In other words, the primary event is actually an energetic failure of those neurons for whatever reason. Could be viral, could be some other infectious agent. Well, when the mitochondria are uniquely um, uh, damaged by free radicals, and it's unfortunate because that's where they're generated, and I mentioned this earlier, but uh, when the mitochondria are damaged by oxidative damage, this damages the electron transport chain. And guess what? When the electron transport chain gets damaged and is functioning inappropriately and inefficiently, it spews out excessive uh, reactive oxygen species and nitrogen species. This compromises energy production, which leads to that calcium influx. And ultimately, the lipids become peroxidated. Uh, peroxidized, which we can measure, and that damages their fluidity and permeability, and ultimately it damages DNA of the mitochondria, which can't really be repaired. And this further leads to increased reactive oxygen species formation. So let's look at this concept of oxidative stress. I'm going to relate it back to APOE4. Again, increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And APOE4 relates to this whole concept of oxidative damage because, as you recall, it is a, uh, involved in um, down-regulating antioxidant function. And again, uh, this is very important. You might carry the APO4 allele, and many of you do. But if you have high levels of a protective antioxidant, in this case, it's nothing exotic. It's beta-carotene. It's on the lunch menu. It's in colorful vegetables. Then your risk of having the downside of that damaging uh, protein setup, a damaging genetic setup, is, is significantly reduced offsetting a genetic predisposition. Uh, this is a, a very interesting article from the uh, Archives of Neurology. It just came out a couple of months ago. And it calls our attention to the fact that this is an early process in even mild cognitive impairment, that there's a free radical mediated oxidative damage to lipids, proteins, DNA, and RNA, as measured by uh, T-bars, um, uh, carbonyls and 5-8-O-H-D, uh, or rather 8-O-H-D-G, and how they correlate with cognitive impairment. And this comes from the Archives of Neurology. This is the American Medical Association's journal, tr uh, journal, specialty journal for neurologists. <laughs> now it won't turn off. What do you think of that? These studies establish that oxidative damage as an early event in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease that can serve as a therapeutic target to slow the progression, perhaps even the onset of the disease. That is an amazing statement coming from the American Medical Association that oxidative damage is a target to even have a, a role in perhaps reducing the onset of the disease, a preventive medicine idea in focusing on oxidative damage to the brain. This, to me, is a call for understanding what are the levels of antioxidants that our patients are receiving and what is their whole profile in terms of how well they're carrying out this activity. Archives of Neurology, July 2007. Better antioxidants and agents used in combination to upregulate defense mechanism against oxidation will be required to neutralize these oxidative components of, of uh, pathogenesis. They will have to be optimized neuroprotective agents and used in the pre-symptomatic phase of the disease. Well, who here has pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's disease? You guys raised your hands. Of course, we all do. 
We're all likely candidates for Alzheimer's disease.